frequency distribution. It's boiled down to this. It's a table. That's all you really have to know. When, when, you talk, when someone talks about a frequency distribution or the book or the teacher or whatever says, hey, there's a frequency distribution, what you need to know is it's just a table. It's a, it's a table of information, right? Um, and it divides the data into groups. And we just call these groups classes, typically. Um, and it shows how many data values occur in each group. So this, this uh, definition doesn't make a lot of sense until I show you what one of these things look like. So that's what we're going to do. We're not going to waste too much time um, talking about it. I really think that it's better to show you. So for an example, so here's an example of a frequency distribution. Let's look at the prices of computers in a store. So we all know we can go to the big uh, electronic stores and there's lots of different computers. There's probably a couple dozen different kinds of computers, right? And they're all at different price points. You can buy cheaper computers. They may not have as many features, but they'll be cheaper. And there may, there may be several models, several different kinds, different manufacturers, whatever, of cheaper, less expensive computers. And then you have kind of the mid-range computers which will be more expensive, maybe a little more features, kind of middle of the road, and there may be several different manufacturers in that price point, right, in that range, and then you might have the expensive computers, which are the top of the line, the really nice ones, the ones that really are the, the bleeding edge, cutting edge stuff, but they cost more, and there could be several manufacturers of the top computers as well. So if, if we were to go take a, a look inside of a store and figure out, well, how many computers are the cheap ones, and how many computers are the middle of the road ones? And how many uh, types of computers are the upper, upper tier? Then we could list all that data and we could list it in what we call a frequency distribution. So let's go ahead and write this down. This is the class. Remember, this is the grouping. When we say the class, it's the grouping. And I'm going to write frequency here. Let me ask you a question before we get too far here. What do you think the word frequency means? Because I know that word scares a lot of people. Well, we, we all have heard of that. I mean, we tune the radio to a frequency. But what do you think frequency is? If I tell you, hey, you know, uh, you have a high frequency of talking back to your mother, right? Or, or if I say, hey, you have a very low frequency of, you know, cleaning up after yourself. What do you think that means? High frequency is when something happens often. High frequency was when something happens a lot, over and over and over again. Frequency is like something that just keeps happening over and over again with great regularity. A low frequency would be something that doesn't happen very often, not very much. If I, if I clean my room with low frequency, it means I'm not doing it too many times per week, right? So that's what that word means, and so that's what we're going to use. Keep that in, in mind whenever we do this problem here. All right, so let's go ahead and see what this uh, frequency distribution might look like if we collected some data. Let's say that we were looking in a store in the price range of $0 to $199 for computers. And whenever we do that, we find that the um, number of computers in the store, the number of models or whatever that we find is zero because that's awfully cheap. There are no computers. Um, you know, in the, in the price range of zero to $199. All right, so the next class, so this would be called a class, right, a group. Notice the definition says it's a table that divides the data into groups called classes. So this class is from zero to $199. And so the next class must then be from $200, $1 more than this, uh, to $399. All right, and when we get that, well, let's just go ahead and write all the classes down, actually. Then we'll have a class from 500, or I should say, actually, from 400, one more dollar than that, to uh, $599, right? And then we have another class from $600 to $799. And then we have another class from, let's just say $800, to it would be $999. And then let's do one more. Let's say we have one more up here from, let's have one, two, three, four, five, six classes, one, two, three, four, five. Here's the sixth class, $1,000 to, uh, let's say, $1,199, something like that. All right, so let's continue on and fill this guy out. So 
There are no computers in the store here. Now in the range of $200 to $399, we go and look at all the models available and there are five models available. So we put, in, put the uh, number in the frequency column there. And then in this range, $400 to $599, that is a nice sweet spot for, for a nice price point for computers. So there are lots of manufacturers making computers in that price point. A little bit above that, um, not too expensive, but you know a little bit m more expensive than this. So there are just a little bit less, um, you know, competition, a little bit less uh, models there in that price range. And then when we get to the high end, 800 to 999. You know, there are a couple of models that are considered high end. And in this particular store, from 1,000 to basically $1,200 or $1,199, there are no models that expensive. So you can see from the table that this is a much better way to represent information than the way you would typically do it. If I asked you, hey, go into the nearest supercenter and go tell me what all the prices of, uh, of the computers are or how, how many computers are of a different price, then you would very likely literally go around the store and write down, okay, model number one, this is the price. Model number two, this is the price. Model number three, this is the price. And you could organize that list of raw data and it would represent basically what this is representing but this frequency table is a much more compact, much more uh, readily digestible way to talk about it because you can easily see that um, here in the low end, you don't have really any, any, uh, any computers there. In the kind of the low end, but a little bit up from there, we do have some nice uh, selection of models. Here is sort of the sweet spot. These two classes here between 400 to 600 and 600 to 800 here. This is where the bulk of, uh, I, I should say, consumers are expecting to purchase computers in these price points. The reason we know that is because most manufacturers are going to supply computers in the ranges that most consumers are going to want to, to spend their money. So this seems to be a nice sweet spot. There is a market for you know uh, computers in the high end, but ultimately you get to super expensive computers and not too many manufacturers want to make computers that cost you know, three and four thousand dollars anymore because nobody really wants to spend money on computers that cost that much. So they, they just don't really make them that much anymore. So this is a frequency table. The reason it's called a frequency is because when I put the number five here, I'm counting the number of models in the store. So it's like, like I told you before, high frequency means it's, it's occurring often. So the bigger the number, the more data points we have in this class. So you could count anything with a frequency distribution, anything where you're tabulating some, some raw data. You could assign some classes. In this case, our classes are the price ranges. And then you could then go count the data that you've collected within those classes and write them down. All right. A couple things I want you to, to notice, though, um, before we kind of move on from this concept of frequency distribution. And that is that these classes do not overlap. They do not overlap, and that's kind of important, and we'll see why later when we start graphing these things. But basically, notice that we have 0 to 199, and then we, we don't have 199 here. See, if we had 199 to something else, then we would have overlap in the classes. Here, this class here is totally distinct and separate from this one. They have to be, because you're basically looking at your raw data and you're trying to decide what bucket to throw it in, what class to throw it in. So if you had overlap between the classes, then you wouldn't know what bucket to, you know, to put it in. So we have to have distinct classes, so they don't overlap. And in this particular class, notice that the class width, that's actually kind of a definition, so I'll write it down. Um, class width in this particular case is actually $200. Class width is basically how wide of a range you're giving yourself on your class. Now you might look up here and you might say, well, the class width here is not 200. The class width is 199 because 199 minus zero is, is uh, you know, 199. But what you need to remember though is that when you count the class width, you're really looking at all possible values in the class. So you have to count zero and then every value in between and you also have to count 199. So really if you, if you subtract them and also count the endpoints of the range, then, then it actually is 200 different values for the class here. And every single time from 400 to 599, there's 200 values, 400, 401, 402, 403, all the way to 599, that's 200 different values. In a histogram, the class width should be the same uh, for every, you know, for every, um, 
you know, for every different class. You know, in other words, you don't want to have zero to 199 and then 200 to 700 and then 701 to 900. You don't want to have that. You want to have, when you're doing a, hit, uh, a frequency table like this or frequency distribution, you want to have the class widths to always be the same for every class so that everything is a nice, you know, nice graduated uh, column there of, in this case, dollars, but it could be anything, so that when we put our frequency numbers down, we can compare one class to another and draw conclusions, and that's what this is for. All right, so let's move on to the other board here, and we will write another frequency distribution down and just get a little more practice. Uh, for this particular one, this uh, frequency distribution is gonna represent the age when people get married. And this could be like in a certain city or in a certain state or in a certain country or whatever, but you, you get some data, you take some, uh, a sample, basically, you take a sample, a survey. You might call a million people and say, hey, how old were you when you got married? Now, some people are gonna get married in their 20s. Some people are gonna get married in their 30s. Some people are gonna get married in their 70s. And then you're going to have some small amount of people that get married really, really young, like when they're teenagers. So it, it's, a, it's a nice spread, but you know you don't want to represent it in a listing of millions or hundreds or thousands of, of just a table of listing of the raw data. You want to represent it compactly so you can kind of give it to someone. They can quickly draw conclusions. So that's, that's what this is for. So then you construct your frequency table by putting a class column and a frequency column. Right, class and frequency, that's all you're doing. And so we need to write our classes down. So an example of what that might look like, it can be different, but this is one way. It might be 15 through 18. It might be 19 to 22. These are ages of people. It might be 23 to 26. It might be 27 to 30. And it might be 31 to 34. Those could be the classes. Now notice right away, that the class widths are the same, 15 to 18. Uh, even though you can subtract them, you're gonna get three, but you need to count the endpoints. So what you have is 15, 16, 17, and 18. There's four uh, different choices in here. So the class width is four. 19, 20, 21, 22, that's four. 23, 24, 25, 26, that's four. 27, 28, 29, 30, that's four. 31, 32, 33, 34, that's also four. So the class width is always four and there's no overlap. Notice it goes from 15 to 18. The next class starts up 19 to 22. So there's no overlap. Those are the same two characteristics I just showed you a minute ago. So we might find that in the range of 15 to 18 years of age, in our particular set of data, two people in our survey uh, actually got married in that range. And then in the ages of 19 to 22, you might see that five people got married in that age range. And then 23 to 26, you might say, see that four people uh, got married in that range. And from this range, you might see that five people got married. And in this range, you might see that four people got married. So this is a frequency distribution or a frequency table of the age of people when they get married. And it's a fairly small sample size. By the way, how do you think you, you would get the sample size? If I asked you, what's the sample size of this information here? How would you calculate that just from this table without any other information? Well, you know that if there's two people that answered here and five people that answered here and so on, then if you add up everything here that, that you have, that's going to be the total number of respondents, right? All you're doing is you're taking your raw data and you're putting in certain buckets. You're taking and putting them in, in these class buckets so that we can draw conclusions. All right, a couple conclusions I wanna draw. The class width is four. Uh, I need to give you another definition here. So let's go ahead and just say the class width is four, right? Now I need to make sure you understand the class limits. The class limits. The class limits are exactly what you might say. The class limits are these numbers here, these end points here, right? that you have here for your buckets. So the class limits in this case are gonna be like 15, 18, 19, 22, dot, 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 basically all of these numbers. And this one here, the class limits are zero, 199, 200, 399, those are the class limits. All right, and 
Now I need to um, tell you that you know the reason that you might do this is this is going to be a lot easier handing someone a piece of paper with this frequency distribution to represent what, what's going on here because at a glance you can see that okay I have fewer number of people getting married at a young age that makes sense there's probably not too many 15 year olds that are getting married but then when I get up into you know adulthood it's fairly constant in my you know in my limited survey here but notice I only went into my 30s. If I took this, this survey all up into the 50s, 60s, and 70s, I would expect a drop off in the frequency of the age of marriage because people do get married in their 60s and 70s and 80s, but not nearly as many as people that they get married in their 20s and 30s uh, like this. All right. So keep this in mind as I introduce one more concept in terms of a frequency distribution. Uh, that you are going to be probably asked about on your exam, and that's called the class boundaries. All right, class boundaries. All right, you might say, well, we just learned about that, didn't we? Well, it's a little bit different. Okay, so the class limit, the class limits are actually the limits that are listed and printed in the table that you have or that you've created. The class boundary is very similar. It's the value in between adjacent class limits. What I'm trying to say here is that notice that here this class limit is 15 and 18 and this class limit is 19 to 22. So and it's just a definition. It's just something that you have to learn. It doesn't really that important to be honest with you. But what they're trying to say is a class boundary is going to be what's in between these two classes. So between 18 and 19, what do you have? Well, you have 18 and a half. Okay. So the class boundary is what's defined to be halfway between the two classes. So in this case, the class boundary between here and here would be 18 and a half. The class boundary between here and here would be between 22 and 23 would be 22 and a half. The class boundary between here and here, between 26 and 27, would be 26 and a half. So don't get confused between class boundaries and class limits. If I had to write it down in terms of math, then what it would be would be the class boundary, CB, that's class boundary, is the upper class limit plus the next lower class limit divided by 2. Notice all I'm doing here is I'm taking an average of the of the endpoints of the of the class limits, basically. So in this particular case, uh, between 18 and 19, it's this pl 18 plus 19 divided by 2. That's a quick way to do an average. It's really easy to figure out what the class boundaries are here because the the numbers are right next to each other. But if you had a different kind of table with the class limits were a little different, then the r the right way to find the class boundaries is really just to average the adjacent the adjacent class limits there. All right, so for instance, if I had another uh, frequency distribution, let's, find, let's say that we collected some data and we know that the age of people at a car show, all right, let's say that we're trying to do something like this. We have class, we have frequency, so this is the data we collect, and then because this is a problem, I'm trying to teach you this, I'm going to calculate the class boundaries. Sometimes you're asked to do that. All right, so let's say, let's say that uh, one class is 15 to 19. The next class up from that is 20 to 24. Notice there's no overlap here in these classes, just like we expect. 25 to 29, 30 to 34, and 35 to 39, all right? So what's the class width? First of all, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. So that's five there. So this is a class width of five. This is a class width of five. This is a class fifth, you know, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. This class width of five. This is a class width of five. This is a class width of five. So everything is a class width that's consistent. That's perfectly right. Now, 
in this range here at this car show, if I go and take a survey between the ages of 15 and 19, I have seven people that's, that are in that class. In this class, I have eight people. In this class, I have 10 people. In this class, I have two people. In this class, I have three people. So the frequency, the number of people that answer yes to the specific class is what I've tabulated here. And if you sum up all of these things, then that's basically the total number of people that I actually asked um, uh, at the car show. And uh, what you can see at a glance is that most people are in their mid to upper 20s, right? Now there is a fair amount of lower 20s, so between these two guys, these represent the two largest classes. There are a lot of younger people that also are interested in the car show, but not very many people in their 30s. That's something very useful. If you were a marketer or if you were running the car show, it might be a nice table for you to have to figure out that most people in their 30s are not really coming to your car show. Most people are probably uh, a little bit younger and mostly in their 20s and their upper teens. All right, so let's calculate the class boundaries. The class boundary for each one of these guys. So what do you think it would be? If I wanted to find the class boundary here, then but let's say between 19 and um, 20. What do you think is between 19 and 20? Well, the right way to do it would be 19 plus 20 divided by two and when you add these up and divide by two, you get 19.5. Now it's pretty easy because you know that halfway between 19 and 20 is 19.5. You also know, for instance, that between uh, 24 and 25 is 24.5, but the right way to do it is 24 plus 25 divided by two is 24.5. So pretty much between all of these limits, everything is, since it's very easy here, it's you know 29.5 between these, 34.5, between these and so on. So the class boundaries for this class would be 14.5, because that's a half lower than this, to 19.5. That's halfway between this and this. This one would be 19.5 to 24.5. And then between this one would be 24.5 to 29.5. This one would be 29.5 up to 34.5. And this one would be 34.5. And this one would be 39.5. All right, so basically what you have here is you have the class with the class limits and the class boundaries. It's a common point for people to get confused. Um, to be honest, in the big picture of statistics, it's not that important. I'm mostly teaching you this so that when you take your test and they ask you, hey, what's the class boundaries here? You'll know what it is because most people for class boundaries will probably just want to list this stuff. The class, uh, the class limits are what are printed in your frequency distribution as the ranges of all of your buckets that you have. The class boundaries are very, very similar, but it's just including halfway until the next one. So notice there's no overlap between these class limits, but the class boundary, there's overlap in every single one of them. All right, and you will learn later why we care about that. It turns out that when we have the class boundaries like this, it can be useful for some things in the future, and that's really why you care. That's basically what we're doing here. So uh, here we've learned about frequency distributions, a very important topic in statistics because so far we've learned a lot of definitions. Now we're finally collecting some data and starting to tabulate data in ways that make sense statistically. Something I can look at, I can kind of get an idea of what that data is telling me without just scouring over. What if I had a survey of thousands of people? It would be difficult to pull patterns out of that. But if I have a frequency distribution, I can look and see what is happening with the highest frequencies? What's happening at the lowest frequencies? And I can see it in a very compact way. That's why we learn this stuff. The class limits are the, the limits of the classes printed. The class boundaries are very similar, but including the halfway mark in between all of these guys. And so we've learned about those things. The class width is, is basically all of the, of the values that you have inside of each class there. So follow me on to the next lesson. We'll continue learning about frequency distributions and just working some extra problems to make sure you understand how they work. And I think we'll find that as we, as we move along here, um, frequency distributions are not difficult and we'll also use them for further topics to study statistics as we move through this course. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.